Well, hello everyone and welcome to episode 11 of Switch of Play with myself, Mark Simpson, and uh, hello once again, Mickey Barron. Good evening, Mark, and good evening everyone that's, that'll be listening. Really looking forward to tonight. Uh, we say that every week, don't we now? But uh, <laughs> this this will be a good one. Um, a guy who I got to know quite well in his time at Hartlepool, a, a lad from the North East who, who travelled at a very young age to to follow his dream really of being a footballer yeah. and played at a really good level with some really good players and and when he came to Hartlepool you could tell his experience and everything that went along with that and he just lifted the whole group along with the other signings at the time so I think he played a really important role at Hartlepool but probably doesn't get the credit that he deserves a lot of the time. I agree I think you know the Chris Turner project that was in process at the time when he arrived I think he was looking to add that extra experience, wasn't he, to the squad? Someone who could, you know, have that little bit of know-how. And, and Tommy ticked a lot of those boxes. Yeah, he did. I think the one thing with Tommy is he always wanted the ball. And mm. as, a, as a defender, whether it was a centre-half or a full-back, he was always there to offer you an option. Whether you didn't have to take it all the time and, and he wouldn't criticise if you didn't pass him. But it's always nice when you can give the ball to someone, even if you just get it back to play it forward again. And Tommy give us that he give us that experience of well I can have the ball even if I'm tightly marked I can, I can get the ball to another midfielder or to the strikers and that was vital at the time we needed someone in that role who was calm and and comfortable on the ball and and had that experience of playing at a higher level and it's just nice to get the you know the opinion of someone else who was who was a part of that success in the early two thousands because we've had quite a few on we could probably put together a decent 11 now we need going to find a goalkeeper from somewhere like but uh oh chris turner just, playing goal it'll be all yeah, right yeah. <laughs> just, just don't get another right back or i might be out <laughs> uh, but last week's uh with richie seems to have gone down well we knew it would obviously he told like lots of lots of things that resonated with people didn't he you know he looked back and, and some of the glory times that that he spent at the club it was brilliant yeah, I think the one thing with Richie is he speaks really well, I think, through his role at the PFA and when, when he was chairman of the PFA. And, and, and that role, he has to speak to groups and to big audiences at some time. And I think that comes across. He, yeah. he, he tells stories really well and, and, and you're interested in what he's going to say. I think it's hard for him because obviously he's got hundreds and hundreds of stories, but in his role that he does now, it's a really important role and it. And at, at times he has to be very careful about yeah. what he can say and what he can't say. So I think he was really keen to talk about himself and his time at Bowles. And, and I was fascinated with all the, the work. He, you know, I know what he does at the PFA, yeah. the detail they have to go into and how many actual players that he's working with. So yeah, it was a, it was a brilliant episode. And, and uh, hopefully everyone got an insight into Richie as a person, but his role is that he does now. We even almost got to the bottom of Custard Gate as well. Yeah, there's still there's still a row brewing about that in our WhatsApp group. <laughs> thinks thinks that he's been framed and Swedes is adamant it wasn't him. So I, I I don't think we'll ever get to the bottom of custard gate unless <laughs> unless there's some CCTV footage in the in the groves now. <laughs> Tommy, how we doing? Good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks, man. Thanks for doing it. That's all right, fella. I don't know what I've let myself in for. Oh, I'll be all right. It's just a bit of crap, bit of laid back chat about your career, basically. That's all it is. Uh, well, that'll take all the 10 minutes. <laughs> I hope you've got this weather up there, have you? Oh, it's glorious here as well, yeah, to be fair. Not in Chelsea Street, it's so Tom. I've literally just come off my last Zoom meeting of the day on in terms of work week. Crikey, mate. Tell you what this has done, this this whole situation has not half made me realise I did too much travelling. Yeah. There's so much more sitting there that I can do. Don't, you know, the time you spend on planes, trains and automobiles to go to meetings and this and what I do now, it's like that'll not be happening. That won't be happening going forward. Well, it'll change how people work, definitely. Oh, massively, massively. Let me turn this around because I'm looking like a ghost there. Yeah, I'll go in a second. The sun will be gone in a little while. I'm just trying to think if I go around here. Wait a minute. Not had this problem been... before. Not even with Fletch in Bournemouth. Did we have this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the sunny south coast. Yeah. See, I'm not in Bristol. You can go and say I'm in. I live in South End. Oh right? dear. So I actually live as far away from Bristol as you do. Near enough. No, I was going to say it's a trek. That. Yeah, it's 100. And, it's 190 miles. But I don't. So, 
it's a remote job what I do. So it, I, I work from here anyway. I've got I've got a team of scouts that I've got over the up and down the country really, um, and I'm just the head of the department. So I oversee what they do and what, whatever they do. Then I have to filter it, give it back to what you know. The upstairs really, I'm, it's 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 that sort of relationship I've got. I've been involved now. But Daz took me there. Daryl took me there in when was that? 2017, and quickly <laughs> off on his own. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> He went, yeah, come down and work with me. He said, we haven't got a scouting department. Can you put one in? I went, yeah, no problem. So I put it, set it all up for him. And then he went, Tom, I've been here too long. I've got to go. I'm going to go. <laughs> so Tommy, Tommy, how did how did you do that? Like, because we're gonna we're gonna start with this anyway. But yeah. when you go into a club and there's no sort of structure there, and how do you set that up? How where do you start? Right. Well, first and foremost, I'm more, I'm a big believer in. Well, I've, I've worked for four managers now in two years. One at one club and three at another club. Now, the constant all of that time was me. And that's because I'm, I'm there for the manager to lean on and request things. So I'll give you a good example. If, if, if you go, if I worked, when I went to Coventry, when I went to Coventry, when I left management in the National League and I went to Coventry and Mark had said to me exactly what you just said, look, Tom, I need... A department. Would you believe Coventry City did not have any databases or anything with any players or scouting record anything? It all went whenever the previous manager at the market had left, his staff took everything with them. So it left nothing at all. So what I had to do was I had to build a, a team first and foremost. Uh, and when I, in 2010, when I got Unceremoniously dumped from South End United as an assistant manager to Paul Sturrock. I was lucky enough to get a, a gig with uh, Lee Clark. He offered me a job at uh, Huddersfield as a scout. And I actually stayed with Huddersfield for about nine years and got to know quite a lot of people and how things worked. And I sort of went up from, from being just a scout who watched games and give me opinion to actually being the southern regional scout for Huddersfield as they climbed through the divisions to the champ, uh, to the Prem. And as soon as the German guys come in, now I he unceremoniously bumped you out as well. So that, common theme, that Tom. <laughs> that was a common theme, yeah. Uh, so, it, it, the answer to your question is, you have to put a structure that, first and foremost, will outlive your manager. That sounds a weird thing to say. But then you've yeah. got to really involve the manager because my position as the head of recruitment, I see it as I work for the, the club, first and foremost, and the manager works for the club. So, we're almost side by side. Um, but in this situation, I've been involved with appointing the manager as well. So I was on a three-man panel to, to choose who became the manager for the for the, for the two since Dara left. Um, so well, you still you still pick Koffel? How are you, man? What are you doing with him? Well, I've got to say, right? Whatever people say about Grim, no, I love him a bit. He did. I did my year license with him. I did, yeah. love him a bit. Yeah. Yeah, he, what he what he did, well, he was he was excellent in the period he was in the job from when taken over when Darrow went to keeping them in that division, which is what he had to do. He did a great job. Now then, then it becomes a bit of a problem because firefighting is one thing. You need a certain type and a certain makeup as a person, as a manager, and but also as a team. And I didn't I didn't feel Grim was conducive to changing his outlook or his approach, or certainly he wasn't. Outwardly appeared to me that he could do that, but anyway, he decided to leave having had a great start of the next season. Um, but it was very difficult to recruit for Graham because he had a very specific type of person, um, profile, attitude to the game, attitude to training, everything that they're becoming sparse, them kind of players, to be honest with you. So it's it's a it's becoming a very different world. I mean, my, ultimately, I, I class my job as. If, if the manager says to me, Tommy, I want a black cup of coffee, then I don't bring him a white cup of tea. Simple. So what yeah. I tend to try and do is, is give the, I don't want them to give me the players they want to sign because I do the whole process from identifying the kind of player to getting in touch with the agent who looks after the player, the club that he's playing for, and ultimately then doing the deal to get him in the club. So I have to do it from inception to birth or inception right. to abortion. So that's my that's my whole job. Um, 
So yeah, it's a, it's a big it's a big process, but I've enjoyed I've enjoyed doing them with both clubs. Working See, when when Neil Cooper came back to Hartlepool, Coops, you know, he's like he'd be like, Mickey, I've heard there's a lad at Scunthorpe. We need to go and watch him. I'd be like, right, who's told you this, Coops? Oh, well, some guy in the pub in Yarm said he might <laughs> his brother had a dog who was related. To, you know what I mean? That sort of thing. So well, I said, this is this is absolutely crazy, Neil. I said, you're the manager of the football club. You shouldn't be going first out to see someone. So I said to John Hewitson at the time, I was like, right, this is how it's going to work. If a scout says he's good, then me or you go. And then whoever goes, so if John went, then yeah. I would, and he came back, he went, you know what, Mickey, I think he's all right. Then I would go with John and vice versa. And then if we both said, I think he's all right for us, then we'd get Neil to come along. Because we're sitting here, you're going on wild goose chases here where you spend yeah. so much time driving looking for the perfect player for your team. It's not it's not yeah. efficient enough for it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it, even just, that was just a small thing to try and improve that recruitment. You've just hit the nail on the head with the word efficiency. I mean, depending on what level that your football club's at and the staff you have available to you, in my opinion, anything in the football leagues need, needs a recruitment department. Not a rec yeah. one recruitment person because if it, it's a bit like you saying to me, "What do you make all the decisions?" I make the decisions as to whether they're presentable to the manager. So the manager tells me what he wants. I to the guys that work for us because I give them detailed profiles. It's not like, "Oh, he's got to have." This, that, good with his left foot, you know, kick it with his right foot. Got to be, it's very, very detailed. There might be 10 or 12 KPIs, like key performance indicators. And also, now with Ben, who's come from a, a higher level in terms of where he's worked, he also wants data matching. So we bookend our whole process now with data. So if you don't have the data historically, unless you're coming out of a club that we know, the only reason you haven't progressed at your club is because your club's too high for you at your age, yeah. 21 or yeah. 20, whatever. Good example, we just signed a lad from um, Chelsea for, called Josh Grant, who's been the England captain at under 19, under 20, under 20. But he ain't going to get through past Reese James and Mark Dewey and, and all these guys at Chelsea. So he's been out on loan a couple of times. The contract, he had a year left on his contract. We come to an agreement that we would we would take him on a permanent and Chelsea did a great deal with us. So the lad can now really kick, hopefully kickstart his career as a player for Bristol Rovers as opposed to the guy on loan from Chelsea. But if he yeah. should... Tommy, I, I, I did the league manager's uh, course down at Warwick with Richie and, and a couple of other lads, Dean Smith, uh, Chrissy Powell was on there. And we had to do a presentation. And I did a presentation at the time saying that clubs should have a philosophy and a style for their club. So you used to have it at Hartlepool all the time. You sign a big centre forward, next manager comes in. Oh, he doesn't fit my system. And I said all along, I said, we need to, like Swansea did for years, they had a system and got players in to fit that system. Yeah. Is that what happens at Bristol or do managers chop and change? Um, well, the, the ideal thing is you don't chop and change your manager. But if you do, your club has to have an MO without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, yeah. it's starting to seep down into League One. It'll be difficult to get the league two again because finances will dictate that the manager will decide. Once your manager decides, you can't then expect when he leaves that the next manager is going to have the same view as him. But if you've got a department that is working alongside your owner or your, your CEO, whoever it is you've got there, and also on the other side working with the manager, then you're all going along in the same boat, basically. Nobody's paddling in the different directions. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a big believer in... You got because I've managed. I would never suggest or or agree with the manager if I thought the person that he wanted to sign wasn't going to help him because I'm one seat removed for him. You know what I mean? So yeah, what you were describing, what you were describing there regarding you know philosophies and that. If you look at Europe, Germany, Spain, Italy, all of them, the manager just picks the team and coaches the team. He doesn't. He doesn't even in the big clubs of this this this. In this country nowadays, some of the managers will not be picking the players to come into the club. They then pick them. But what they've done is they've said, I want a player like Billy Bloggs, Mickey Barron, 
marks and uh, whatever. It's not many of them are wrong. Person's brought. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're right. If, but if that person's brought, then it's assumed that that manager can use that person. So yeah. that's basically how it works. But the the higher up you go, the less and less and less and less the manager has to do with the recruitment. All he does yeah. is tell you the profile of each position. So Tommy, when obviously a player comes in, and some players will fit every tick box and then it still doesn't work out for them who is that just a, is that one where you have to hold your hands up or the manager says i am coached them or is it just a given that you're going to get some of them i think it's i think what you've got to remember is we're working in human beings so yeah. it's not like if, if i nicked your car keys your car run for me exactly as it runs for you so it's a, it's an inanimate object like we, yeah. We've just seen Jack Baldwin, who's been up at... Yeah, yeah, I was just going to just talk yeah. about Jack. Yeah. So, you know, I know Jack's got the pedigree. I've seen enough of him at, at all the clubs he's been at. I've been at clubs that have tried to sign him before. We know his level is at least this, this division. We know he can play there. But, yeah. God forbid, his, his wife and children are coming down, moving down with him. If they don't settle, if the kids have problems at school, if the missus can't get a job or can't find it, whatever it is, we, all of them... Non-controllables are basically that. So I'm I'm a big believer. If when when signings go well, I never ever scream and shout about them or I sign them or I send because they also don't go well. And there's nothing you can do. There's nothing I would do less to make a signing that didn't work than I would that a signing that did work. Yeah, it's well, not like you work less hard to no, get that player in. No, and it, it, it doesn't work out for them. It's that's it. I mean, ultimately, you try and do as much due diligence as you can. Get and get. Get eyes on him, you know. Get the data, get all of that. But ultimately, he is a human being, and it, it, he might he might do ever so well in the northeast of England, and, and not settle so well in the southwest of England. We don't know. But yeah. they're all things that, having played the game myself and moved around a lot myself, you hope and you're going to have that kind of mentality from the players that you. Because I'm I'm usually the first person that meets the player. The manager will meet them after me. Or certainly yeah. I chat with them anyway in, in these times, more like on a video or on a phone call. But um, yeah, it, it is. There's no, there's no exact science. There's not a person on this planet who is in human recruitment, whether it's in football or whatever, that gets every one of them right. Nobody, you can't. Well, how much work goes, goes into the, the character side? Then, Tommy, you mentioned that because obviously with Jack Baldwin coming in, yeah, I, I know Jack. You know, he's a diamond of a lad. I know he's going to be a great club man for you. He was fantastic yeah. captain of Peyton Rec. And when he gets his confidence back, I'm absolutely sure. But how much, how, how much work can you do in terms of finding out about a player's character? More than you, th more than you think, fully enough. Because at the end of the day, now most of the players and certainly the clubs they've been playing at have got social media sites that you can look through. There's a lot of that goes on. You know, if you've got Twitter, Twitter accounts and then Instagrams and all of this, that you, a lot can be bad and things like that. Obviously, um, I think when it gets to the point where you know you're gonna make a move to sign the guy as, as my role I'll do as much due diligence if I know there's a player playing with him who I know or a coach or a manager so I've got all of that four or five possible knocks on the door at the club he's at or the clubs what about the fact that even the scout that took him to Hartlepool United funny enough I'm very good friends with him he lives in Faversham in Kent where Jack started so yeah. from that point of view, it's a weird thing that sometimes it just happens and you think I've chased him for ages and do you know what they eventually got him because I knew somebody who knew him 10 years ago when he went wherever he went. So, See, I mean, uh, when he went to Sunderland, obviously he was at Hartlepool with me and we put him in the team when he was whatever he did. Even when he came to Hartlepool, he was, his technique was as good as anybody in the building. You could just see it straight away. And when he went to Sunderland, I've got a few Sunderland fans, a couple at work, and I was like, this lad will be a diamond for you. And, and the 50-50 about them, some of them absolutely love him. Yeah. And others are like, you can't defend. But the ones that see what he can do on the ball can see that side of him yeah. as a footballer. So it's what you're saying. It, it, opinions split on everyone. It doesn't matter whether you're yeah. a fan or... I don't, listen, I, as I'm saying about everybody can have opinion. I just don't listen to them all. That's all. You know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, judged, I'm judged by a higher, higher source than the media or the public. That's how yeah. I look at it. I mean, at the end of the day, like you said, some people would have loved, you know, would, would have loved Jack at Hartlepool at Peterborough at Sunderland, and some people wouldn't. It's just the way people are built. So I think as long as you get a guy who commits to you, when I say commit, when I, 
I mean, if you commit by bringing your family like he's doing, he's from the south anyway originally, but he's 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 going he's going nowhere near where he's from. He's going yeah. to Bristol. So he's done this with all these moves. Jack has, by the way. He even moved to Salford when he was on loan, which I just think the commitment from that from the player at that by doing that is is quite remarkable to be honest. So, like I said, we 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 can do as much due diligence as we as we possibly can without intruding into their lives too much. But <laughs> like I said, I, I'll have very different contacts to Ben because Ben's worked at a different level to me at a different era. So yeah. he'll have a lot of coaches and managers around that I might not be in contact with, but I know the agents and I know the players who Jack played with back in the day or whatever it is. <clears throat> so I, it's just I, I, picked, I picked Jack up from the train station when he moved to Hartlepool, when he turned up with his one big bag over his shoulder, nervous little lad like... What's going on? And I took him to the shop and got him a few bits and pieces. We bought, I remember we bought my Hartlepool mail because there was a big photo up on the back of the mail and he was like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> it was brilliant like to see how... So, so, Simo, that was your proper job, a taxi driver. I, honestly, I, I, I thought you'd have had anything, Mick. <laughs> Tommy, you, there's not many of us made that journey, by the way, because I was picked up by that station by Chris and Colin. I tell you, <laughs> for, for reasons best kept secret, I couldn't drive at the time. <laughs> Tommy, we're going to come on to that in a little bit. Going back to your checklist without giving too much away, could you yeah. could you give us an insight into some of the things that you would look for? Obviously, I would presume age would be one thing that you look for. Well, as a, as a club... I don't want to drop anybody in it who was at the club before I was, but as a club, Bristol Rovers have not got a fantastic record of, of developing and selling players. So we have an owner who has been unbelievable since I've been there. Daryl will probably tell you the same if you'd spoken to him. He backs the club tremendously. But it's a, it's a great game, football, but it's a very, very cruel, and there's another word, business. You know, the business yeah. side of it is very important. And I think... This climate that we're in now is proven. I mean, I know factually, had League One gone back to playing football for them last nine or ten games, nearly half of the clubs in that division would probably have gone to the wall because there's no sustenance without play. It's like I'm in a restaurant, you can't serve food. If you've got a football club and you can't play football, how the hell do you survive? You know, so unless you have got an owner, or a benefactor, or a person like we have at our club who, who, who has recently cleared a, a huge debt to the football club, then I feel for people, I really do. But there's, no, there's not one, I couldn't say to you then, oh, he has to be this and he has to be that, because it's horses for, horses for courses. Yeah. Now, like I said to you, without being too detrimental to the previous manager that I worked for here, nearly all his profiles were the same. Right. Because that's the way he's built. And I understand that. I, you know, and I didn't knock him for that, but it made it very difficult to try and entice him. What about this one? What about that one? Because some people have to work with people that they know. That's, 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 that's an issue in football because yeah. when you get a job, you're not always able to take the players or the, or the staff you want, want with you. I mean, can you? So it's it. There's not one definitive thing. I mean, what, what we want is we want people who are going to be progressive. So you'll probably rarely see me at Bristol Rovers signing a guy over 30. It'll be you'll be nearer 20 with with the chance for us to keep developing or grow with him or you know, so we can if he can't take us up, because we want to get promoted without a doubt, we want to we want to have a go. Um, if we can't go up as a as a group, then we'd like to think we're going to sign players who in a year or two years' time, we'd be able to move on and we can reinvest the, reinvest the, the money and what have you because we're not putting out fees for players this, these days. It's just mm -hmm. smaller, the smaller transfer market isn't there anymore. You know, like I said, clubs, clubs, a lot of clubs are, are, are working hand to mouth as it is. So the transfer market is nigh on nil at the bottom end, which makes me a little bit annoyed when I hear about the numbers bandied about at the top of the football pyramid and you think, you know, a week's wage to one or two of them Premier League would keep football clubs that are really struggling at the bottom end going for years, going for yeah. years. But, so, but it's what it is. Tommy, so before, uh, I don't want to take name individuals, before you sign someone, how many times would would a, a player have been watched by your sort of scouting network before you go, yeah, he's someone we can sign? Okay, well... Um, but well, before we even go out and watch him, it did, again, COVID's changed this because now, if you think 
I knew the window was opening, or I thought the window was open at the end of May. So our target list was already in place way before the lockdown. Now, when I say target list, we, have, we would have had, let's say, lists that long for each position that I know Ben Garner wanted to, to bring in. So yeah. I knew he wanted to bring in two central defenders. I knew he wanted to bring at least one central midfield player, um, a forward, and a weighed, or a weighed forward or number 10 who can get waived. So that's how to play. So straight away, the lists were, you know, squished, if you like. And because we got locked down, some of them, um, we may not have been able to see again, but we had done the, we'd done the work because we knew we wanted it done anyway. So what's happened because of the lockdown has made us, as you used the word uh, earlier, made us a little bit more efficient by going through data first. So if there's a kind of player he likes, and let's say it's, you know, let's say it's, I don't know, somebody who you know we're not going to say, McAleary, Claude McAleary, there you go. So we know what Claude McAleary does as a player, what's his, what's his, be his best attribute. He's not a good attribute. You wouldn't want him marking at a corner, for instance. He's three foot six. Okay, so if, if that's the case, we, we have a data company that works alongside us now. And we say, this is the kind of player we want. These 10 things he's got to have in his game. They come back with lists. Now, these lists might be in France, Germany, Scotland, anywhere. But then I'll say to them, look, for this window, we're really looking at British because COVID, we can't see there being an appetite to come from Europe over here at the moment. You know, there's not the economic uh, clout that there was last year, all of that sort of stuff. So it's, that process has taken over from the general... You said about Neil is brilliant. You said what you said. Neil Cooper heard that a pub look in the pub had mentioned a lad playing for Gisborough or something that scored a load of goals. Listen, I would never ever turn that information down. I would get somebody to go watch that. I'd get my man in the north. He's just going to have a look at him. If he comes back and says, Do you know what, Tom? He's got something in. We, we just signed a lad out the National South, and I, I genuinely believe he'll have a good career in a football league. No. Will he jump straight into League One and score the amount of goals he did in the National League? Don't know. But all these suggestions would. We've seen him enough times. So I would send a regional scout. Then I would send another regional scout. If both of them come back positive, because I trust them as much as I do, I would make the journey myself. Right. But once I've seen him, then I would tell the manager, look, the department are strong on him. You can watch them on a video. I can get a load of clips for you or do whatever it is you want. So we can give the manager. So the manager doesn't have to go and watch them per se as live. But the manager can listen to what we've done. We obviously document what we've written about them. It's all there for, for the manager and the staff to have a look at. Uh, and ultimately, if the manager says, yeah, I like him. Now, if the manager says, no, it doesn't mean that he is not going to stay in my mind or our process. Because like I said, the recruitment department will outlive the manager. Because when I leave, I'm not taking everything I've done with me. That's Bristol Rovers. Is. Like I left Coventry's. I left Coventry in a much better state than I, than I did find it because I didn't find anything there. <laughs> so the, the fact, the fact in, in, in a year, we, we did 19 new faces at Coventry and got promoted at the first attempt. I left there with my head held high. In, uh... So there's got, there's got to be a lot of trust there, Tommy, from the manager on, on yeah. the system and your department. If if you're going to him and, he, and he's, he's got to have that trust to say, right, I, I, I believe what you're telling me and, and I'll sign him on, on what your department is saying. That, that's a lot, of, a lot of trust from the management of your department. Well, you've got to remember, the manager was appointed by our department. <laughs> so from that point of view, <laughs> I, I, I'm just thinking, Toby. He was on our management course, Ben. He was at Crystal Palace, wasn't he? That's right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he, was on, yeah. he was on our management course. Yeah. I couldn't understand the word he said because he brought a cockney. I was like, ah, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a nice guy, I remember. Yeah, he's, I just thought he that. is. And, and like you said, the trust can only build up, be built up once the relationship starts. And the relationship yeah. will start with me and him, it did. Well, I, was, I was there when he came for the interview. So I was one of the three people that interviewed him. So straight away, I knew what he was going to be like to a degree when he came. Now, everybody, like you said about due diligence for players, no different for managers. I spoke to people that he'd worked with that I know. So you know, people who are very prominent people in the game. I don't want to say their names, but they're very, very trustworthy people who've managed at the highest level in England and have worked with Ben. So, you know, we, we knew what we were getting as a character, an absolute solid lad. He was just, he's probably a little bit left field for a lot of people simply because, 
statistically he hasn't been a manager. But then there was Alex Ferguson one day. You know, so you've got you've got have, opportunity is the the mother of how you you start any career. You know, loads of footballers these days aren't going to be footballers because they don't get the opportunity. It's not it's not because they're not good enough. But Tommy, just going on what you're saying about never not following up a lead. There's a there's a a lad who he used to be a defender. Or he's actually playing now over forties at the moment. He used to be a right back, but he's turned himself into an attacking midfielder now, and he's got about eight goals last season. <laughs> So if you want to, if you want to send a scout up, I'll, I'll wave at him if you want to come see it. It's up to you. I don't know. I don't know whether I fit any of You didn't just say you were playing as an attacking midfielder there, did you? Yeah. You never. <laughs> Number ten. Hey, hey, we did a few we did a few shifts in the we did a few shifts in centre on the field together, if you remember. We, yeah, we did, yeah. We did Hull 4-0 one night on a Tuesday night, I think. I uh, that's right, yeah. You haven't mentioned that yet, Mick. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy, I did. So that's obviously the recruitment side of players. Do you are you involved in a match analysis as well? Because I did eighteen months working for Fulham as for their first team, and I absolutely loved it. Uh, the detail of what they wanted, oh. and it was Jukanovic at the time that that I was working for, and I spoke to him. Well, I spoke to his sort of the guy in charge of all the analysis, and I said I want to know how he plays and, and his systems. And he wouldn't tell us. He, he didn't want. He said because that will judge, it will cloud your judgment of what you're seeing because you'll be thinking this is what he wants, this is what he doesn't want. But I absolutely loved it. Do you do, you do that side of it as well, or do you have other people to do that? I don't do game analysis. And I don't cover games for the manager. He doesn't want them. This manager doesn't. The previous manager right. did. He wanted them watched at least. If we were playing away from home to Bolton, he wanted Bolton watched at Bolton. And I understand that. But there's so much video availability now to players that it's like you, you, there's nothing you can't you can't hide. You can't hide what you you know. Yeah. know what you know. It's it's on it's on national television most of it these days, isn't it? You know, at the end of the day. So. Um, I don't get involved with match analysis, but he shows me it. So if I ask, like he showed me the first, they've been back training for four days. He's already sent me the first two days full videos of what we're doing. So I get a feeling as to if the guys that we brought in are fitting in, not fitting in, all of that sort of thing. So the analysis side of things is massive for me. Yeah. Again, Huge. because Ben's, Ben's worked in the Premier League and had that level of it, which is mental. We, we've got a watered down version, but he's strong on, on analysis massively. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember on our, on our management uh, course, there was a guy there and he, he was working at Bolton at the time. Chris, someone, I can't think of his name, you'll probably know him. Um, but he was telling us what Bolton had in place and, and they had a system, a computer system, that every, so every article in a paper, newspaper, internet thing, if it had transfer or rumour, that they would get sort of that sent to them so they could see every person that was getting linked to Bristol, to Hartlepool, to their team in Scotland. And he says, and it's up to our scouts to filter them down to see if there's anyone. Yeah. And he says that that's just like one person's job. He said, we might have another 10 people working wow. on other things. And the amount of detail that he was going into was incredible. Oh, yeah, massively. You've got to be very careful if you've got the word Scunthorpe in that finder. <laughs> <laughs> but you, but, you, but that, that's, that's a method used by lots of people. I, again, I, like I said to you, and I, I kid you not when I say, my guy in Scotland, he's got ownership up there, to be fair. When he says to me, Tom, you need to come and see this one, I'm on a plane or a train and I'm going up there. So the, lo the local knowledge part of it, I'll never, ever, ever believe that you don't need somebody. And I use this tongue-in-cheek with a big mark and a flat cap to stand in the side of the pitch because you can't beat that. Believe me, you cannot beat that. You can, you can help it and you can disagree with it, but you can't beat people who watched the amount of games that even I have now. I mean, I, you'd, be, you'd be amazed. I, I usually watch about four seasons of football in this season. Attend. Attend. Now, the COVID thing is going to change that. Like I said, I'm going to do a lot more analysis and, and statistics before I go out and I'm going to go out to make decisions rather than going mm, I'll have to have another look I'll have to have another look you know what I mean yeah. I'm not one for doing that anyway I, I, I tend to make my mind up very quickly yeah fantastic yeah well, I think we've uh, learned more <laughs> I'm, I'm not, honestly I wasn't expecting that conversation to go on there I've been so fascinated do, by do you know what Simo it's 
it's a part of the game that I wish every club could have the biggest department of recruitment, if you, if, yeah. if that makes sense, because it's so important. And, and even in my time in Hartlepool, when I was working with the first team, we signed players because, like Tommy said, Coops might have known the agent and he's gone, oh yeah, that guy will do your job. And then when he comes, you think, what have, we haven't done enough no, to it, work on this, you know what I mean? So it, the one no-no for me is, the one no-no for me is, oh, let's go and get him. Why? Because he was brilliant against us. I went, no, that's a not, yeah. not doing that. <laughs> You've seen them once against you and you're emotional. Management and the coaching staff are emotional during their own games. So, yeah. you, you know, you, you, I, always, <laughs> I always laugh when that happens and it happens a lot. Oh, he was brilliant against us. Well, we were obviously pretty good then. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we, we say one at Arnipole and, and I'm not going to say any names, but because he'd gone for a lot of money earlier in his career, well, that was probably seven, eight, nine years when we signed them. And, and the reason, when I was, I was sitting there going, but yeah, he was a good player then, or well, he had yeah. the potential to be a good player then. Someone's obviously bought it, but it doesn't mean he's going to be, well, anyway, we'll leave that one to people to guess who that was. I'm racking my brains now. <laughs> one club that does seem to be getting it right is, is Brentford, isn't it? Brentford have got a very quite unique recruitment system. And yeah, I mean, we... we we are we are morphing towards that, and I think a lot of clubs are because of this the salary cap and what have you now. Clubs like Brentford are in an ideal location to catch the things that are falling out around them. There's big clubs around them, and Fulham went up again. They got like Chelsea, Fulham, Tottenham, West Ham. They got all of that that they can pick the, the droppings out of, if you like. Now, as Bristol's a two a two city. Uh, there's two teams in the city, if you like. It's difficult for us to turn away. We're not going to get rid of the academy like Brentford did. But behind the first team, we've let all of the under-23s go that are, under, that are over 20, even though two or three of them had, an, had a chance, to be honest with you. But they weren't in our first team pool of only 21, which is what we've got now. So we're going to have to find games where the guys who don't play every week are going to be hand-picked fixtures, a bit like Brentford do. But it's, they, they, they're doing it, again, they'll take players that you guys or the, or the public would go, why are they signing him? Watkins from Exeter, for instance. I mean, that, that jump he made from there to there has been unreal. And the way he's seamlessly gone in and done. So what they did, whatever they did, they get, they, they get more right than wrong. I know that. A very good system then. And bless them, the guy who was in the head of the recruitment department passed away about 18 months ago. Um, when a young guy, big Rob Roy, and lovely fella, Scottish guy, um, that he was a major part of what they were doing there, and I, and I was a good friend with him. So it was a, that was a huge, huge loss for Brentford. But it, 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 as you say, their philosophy has not wavered. Different head of recruitment, different manager, doesn't change. So yeah, Tom, Tommy, just going back to the start, obviously your football career kicked off, you know, down in Southampton when you you made the move down there. Just tell us a little bit about how that all came about, because you know you were as far away from Southampton as you can probably get, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> going straight back to recruitment, but they had a satellite centre in the northeast in Newcastle at Gateshead right. International Stadium, and um, they'd already recruited Stevie Davis, Barry Wilson, Alan Shearer, Jamie Webb. No, not Jamie Webb. Sorry, it was Jason Walkington from the Darley, Darlington area, and then Neil Madison. So there was already a, a sort of four or five guys down there before me. Um, and I went, I went to the satellite centre first, where they actually used to have somebody come and coach us on a Monday night for two hours. Yeah. Um, I sent schoolboy forms, which back then, and every school holiday, I would go down there, spend near enough the whole time down there. Basically on trial, really, when I look back. But you were, you were connected to the club because I lived so far away. I suppose they, they judged me against their local ones. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to get offered a, an apprenticeship. And listen, with my hand on my heart, and I mean this all sincerity, there's no way in the world I was the best player at the position I was playing when I went down there. But I happened to score more goals in my last season in youth football than Alan Shearer did. <laughs> Would you I can't believe that. It's true. I played as a centre forward. That's, that's more, more far-fetched than me being a captain <laughs> midfielder. It's true. <laughs> I actually started as a number nine. There you go. 
And I was, I was, I was absolutely, <laughs> I, used to, I used to score for fun. And then, anyway, because Shearer had done what he did, I, it was viewed like, oh God, we got another one of them. But about, in, within about a month going down there, I was turned around and sitting in the back of the midfield shouting and bawling at everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a nutshell, I went down there being Shearer and I come back like, no, I'm more like, I don't know what I was more like, but it wasn't him. But, but, I, but I, I believe the character that I, that I gained by traveling to Southampton every school holidays, away from my parents to, I never went, I never went on holiday with my mum and dad ever, not once in my life. Still haven't, weird, eh? Because I, was da- <laughs> because I was down there. I was down there from 14 to 16, and then I moved when I was 16. So I grew up, I grew up very, very quickly. And I was lucky, like I said, I had Alan and Neil Madison, Stevie Davis, all them guys down there who I knew from being up here. Um, so we had a little sort of northeast in a, in a bubble. Of course, the youth team manager was a Geordie also, Dave Merrington, and of course, Laurie McMenemy yeah. who set it up. So Laurie had moved on by the time I got there, but he came back when I was actually in the first team. And he, wit- and he witnessed the most horrendous challenge I've ever made in, uh, in a game for Southampton against Port Vale in Alan Ball's first game, and I got rightly sent off, um, which cost me <laughs> me starting birth against Newcastle. St. James's on the Saturday, I was going to start. Oh, I mean, man. Oh, I was, yeah. yeah. Well, Tommy, anyway. I remember in Chelsea Street, I remember our district team and the, the Southampton coaches came in, did probably three or four sessions with our district team, and, and they maybe took one or two out there. So they are obviously having a big push at the time in the North East, but I can't imagine myself even later on in my career moving to Southampton but to do it at such a young age yeah. it must have been some it, it must have involved. been wrenching to leave home and, and to you know be what? that far away uh, well you know what it was uh, I don't know I mean I, I was brought <laughs> take this I was brought up living in pubs no I don't mean living in the pub I mean I lived above the pub my mum and dad were publicans so it wasn't like we had a listen I had a great Great parents, nothing wrong with that. But it wasn't like, it wasn't your stereotypical, like I said, two up, two down, two holidays a year or anything like that. So I was like, yeah. I, I wanted to be a footballer. At the very last minute, Newcastle wanted to sign me. I wasn't kidding when I scored more goals than Shearer in my last season. But I didn't, I didn't bend. I went because Jack Hickson was the scout who'd seen me at 14 and stayed with me all the way through. Um, and it was a natural progression for me. I had worked in my head. i never forget sitting down with a careers officer at school and she said, well, what are you going to be? This when I was like 15. I said, well, I'm going to be a footballer. She went, yeah, army. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, no, I'm going to be a footballer. She went, okay, yes. She said, well, if you don't, the army or the navy might be good for you. I said, well, I can't swim, so I'll be going in the navy. But anyway, <laughs> the next progression was to go down there. And I, and I was, you know... Like I said, I grew up very, very quickly because I had people around me who I trusted, I suppose. Um, but I only came home once in my two years apprenticeship, would you believe? Because the, it was the first Christmas. I came home. I think I was home for about four or five days. I went back. And after that, I, I went on loan. And then I, then I got in the first team fairly quick, or first team group. So I couldn't get the times off that the other apprentices were yeah. getting off. It was, uh, it was something. I've never lived back. I've never lived back in Newcastle. In fact, I've lived in the South now a hell of a lot more than I did in Newcastle because I'm what, getting on to that age. So I've, I've actually lived in the South or South of Newcastle double the amount of time I've lived in Newcastle. Just about clinging, clinging on to the accent though, Tommy, yeah? Well, when I'm speaking to you blokes, I can easily turn back into that. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, but, but down here, I mean, if I speak like that, there's not a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> But Tommy, I remember my white yes days. Uh, I'm still friends with probably ten of the the sort of sixteen, eighteen you had at the time, and and really good friends with them. Keep in touch and speak all the time. Obviously, you being down there with the other Geordies, that must have formed the hell of a bond that you had with those people that you were talking about. Because you're away from home, you're doing the same thing every day, but you've got a common bond of being from the northeast. Massive. It was huge. It was. It was. It used to make me laugh. In fact, it used to make me really smile inside when, one one weekend of the season, the club used to invite all the scouts from all over the country down, and they used to watch a youth team game in the morning and a first team game in the afternoon. And all the scouts would stay in the one hotel, and it was either the Park Hotel in the middle of Southampton, and then when the Hilton got built at the edge of Southampton, it was there. 
And the North East boys were the only ones who went to the hotel after whichever game we'd played in. Usually the first team was Al and myself, the boys I mentioned. And we'd sit all night and have a beer with the scouts. And nobody else's youngsters turned up. And we used to go, yeah. We, we, yeah, we don't, we, but we, we used to love that. And, and it wasn't just Jack Hickson. There was a lad called Jackie Robson from Darlington. He was a big part of it. And Jackie Best, another lad from Newcastle. So the three Jacks. That's the old, the old scouts from the northeast. If you if you think about it, there's actually there's a there's a website or an app you can go on these days and put in a postcode and you can see how many professional footballers come from this postcode. And Newcastle's got really? one. Or the northeast. Is, oh yeah, northeast is like massive. There's so many gone from there. To, you know, and and that's why Southampton and Laurie in particular made a beeline for it. He won daft. Well, I was going to say, Tommy, the, the Newcastle, the Sutherland, the Middlesbrough scouts at the time must have been getting their asses kicked. When they're seeing all these young Geordies going all the way to Southampton and then obviously getting into the first team in Southampton and going on to careers that, that you had, you know what I mean? There must have been some eyebrows raised in the local scouts when they're thinking, well, they're on our doorstep and they're leaving. Yeah, I mean, listen, you've probably heard it as much as I have. I mean, the famous story that Shiro was there and they stuck him in goal. You know what I mean? It was, it's opinion, isn't it? it, it at the time, it's what, what that club was looking for and why and whatever. But at the end of the day, to have to buy a bloke back for 15 million quid um, when he lived a mile down the road, it was... It, so it, it, is, it, a, it wasn't just Rich Humphries that got stuck in goal on the trial then. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about the only position he didn't play, is it? That goal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a strange one. You, when you think, just the lads I mentioned, Alan went for eventually, well, he went for three million from Southampton originally, then he went for 15, I think, to Newcastle. Um, Stevie Davis moved for near enough a million to, to Luton, and then Burnley, and he then was, back to Luton. He was a good player in Tommy, really good player. He did, he's in recruitment now, Steve. He works for Everton. Stevie, right. Stevie's high in there, yeah, recruitment in Everton. Um, then you got Neil Madison, who was at Southampton a long time, then he went to Pura, did really yeah. well. I do some coaching still with Maddo every now and yeah, again. Yeah, I see him. And he's, he's like, uh, he looks after the loans coming out of Borough, doesn't he? He goes That's around right, and yeah. the kids are all right and looks at their digs. And I bumped into him. I bumped into him in Scotland a couple of weeks ago. No, I yeah. put the lockdown, obviously. Um, nice guy. Yeah, but yeah, not one of us that went down from the North East didn't have some sort of career, hmm. which tells you the recruitment in Newcastle at the time either... Hey, there was too many players good enough at the time or they just didn't see it in us. And everybody develops at different stages, you know. Like I said, I was, <laughs> you're going to laugh even more, Yannick. I was actually a quick striker as well when I was a kid. But I wasn't, I wasn't quick at all when I got to Southampton. I was actually slow. <laughs> it's, it's just amazing when you see some sort of career. But I bet there's a few Premier League appearances amongst that group there and... Uh, do you know what I mean? And 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 I think you're underselling that a little bit about how how good that group was. So how old when you got in that team, Tommy? How old were you when you made your debut for Southampton? And who were the players that were in the team with you? Well, I'll tell you what. At least half of them I'd played with in the youth team and the, and the reserves. Which, Ken Monk was Ken Monk out playing then, or not? He came. Ken came eventually. He came from. For some Chelsea. reason, I used to love. I used to love watching him. I don't know what it was about him. It was just yeah. one of those players. I used to always think, Joe, you know he's got a bit of style and something about him. Ken Monko. Two yeah. two things about Ken Monko. He used to lather himself in baby oil before he went out and Vaseline. <laughs> okay, that's probably why I like him. <laughs> I used to say, "What are you doing?" He went, "They can't grab hold of me." He says, "So when they get near me, they grab me, they slip off. I get a yard. I'm off like that." <laughs> anyway. That's not the best story. The best, <laughs> the best story is, the best story is, we played at Old Trafford. I was lucky enough to play at Old Trafford about four or five times. I never won there. And i never forget Nicky Adams sitting on the bus saying to me once, I think we got beat 2-1 in a, in, a, in a game. And he said to me, look, that's a moral victory, fella. I went, what? He says, not many people come here and don't get their horses felt. And I was like, well, I'll remember that in case I ever get back here. Like, so we, we went back this, this time. And we happened to... And never forget, Matt Letizia got taken off and Nicky Benger came on and scored in the 81st minute. It, and we won the up. And I'm thinking, I'm looking at the clock thinking, bloody hell, we, we could win this. We could actually win. <laughs> and I looked behind me and Ken is holding his hamstring, as he called it. Okay? And I've gone, <laughs> I'm looking at the side 
On the bench, we've got Kevin Moore, who was 30-odd year old, tough as teak. Bless him, he's passed away with he passed away very young at 50 odd. But he was he would have been a perfect bloke to bring on for five minutes just to make sure we were seeing the game out one 0 Mr. Ferguson sees Kenny's hamstring is hurting him. <laughs> and so he he puts he puts right Ryan Giggs from the left down the middle. And in Fergie time, he scores two goals. We get beat 2 1. Oh. Now, I'm my is going like that. I'm, I'm going, oh my God, can't believe it. So, I've, obviously, I'm five foot ten and off. Kenny's about six foot three and built like an oak tree. He's a big boy, like, you know. But I'm really peeved off here yeah, because I see my opportunity to have won it all, Trapper. So, picks me out of World Cup up, wallop, straight at his barnet. <laughs> he's hit him somewhere here. He's gone. What? what? I went, mate. I says, why don't you? Just, why didn't you come off? Got Kevin Moore sitting there. Lost two one. I went off it. He's come stomping over towards me like that. I'm looking like that. <laughs> Alan Bob's in between us going, oh well, that's oh well. <laughs> but that was that was my first story with Kenny Monka. God, that day I could have, if I could have chinned him, I would have. <laughs> I think, Tommy, I think that's why I used to get home so well with you because I used to love that side of you, you know what I mean? You had that sort of aggression and passion, but it was all to do with the will to win. You wanted to win. And and I, I, I sort of, I felt like I was very similar in that way, you know what I mean? It was like, I don't care, like, if I upset you, that wasn't what was the best thing to do at the time. So I'm going to tell you, and if you don't like it, I don't care. Do you know what I mean? It was like... You know- Alicia, I, I think that's, that's a part of the substance of a player that used to be an absolute must. It's not there anymore, that. It's not all about winning. It's not. It, the kids are told these days it's not about winning, it's about developing. But as soon as you get in the first team environment, it's not about developing, it's about winning. You know, yeah. so we, we, we give mixed messages, I think, these days, whereas yeah, yeah. one of the absolute prerequisites was substance as a person, as a character, you know, you had to be mentally strong enough to handle a young lad going into a dressing room. Like the first dressing room I walked into had Jimmy Case, Russell Osman, Derek Statham, John Burridge, proper, proper players I'd been watching <laughs> on the telly when I was 10. You know what I mean? And I'm thinking, how the hell do I get in here? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I'm a big believer. I did play with one or two clubs that I could not stand, right? Wouldn't socialise with them, didn't like them. But I respected what he did on the football pitch for me and with me. So if he didn't do what his job was, I would absolutely delight him throwing a brick down his throat and let him have it. But but if he did, I accepted that and I got on with my job as, as a as a professional. But <laughs> going back to Shannon and Bourne and people, it, it puts me to remember when I first when I first come up, I may never forget this. I can't remember who we were playing, but it wasn't going particularly well at the start, if I remember. And we conceded another goal in James Sharp, who had been highlighted as a gladiator and this, that, and the other, <laughs> the season before. He'd done really well, if you remember. Yeah. He was having a one. He was having a one. And I remember going back and picking the ball out of the thing and having a little pop at him. I said, are you going to pull your finger out or what? And Taff stuck up for him. And I went, I said, Taff, I said, you can shut up. I said, if we keep doing this, mate, we're going that way then. We've got to get the division that way first. <laughs> I remember Sharpie had played that season when he won, he won like supporters player of the year and he had a really good season and then he came back pre-season and he, I don't know whether everything just went to his head but he was trying like flicks in training and he was trying to like rip one of the ball and, and, and we're just singing, just head it, kick it and do a long throw and that you'll be all right but it, for some reason it just totally changed in six weeks of pre-season. So going back to that well, team, Tommy, yeah. that you played in, yeah, I yeah. mean... I think without, obviously, Shearer was in that team, but Leticia as well. I mean, there were some unbelievable players that you, that you were playing with in yeah. that team at that time. Yeah. Um, it's funny, isn't it? People say to me, oh, who's the best player you've played with? Or who's the toughest player you've played against? And all of that sort of stuff. The best player I've been on a football pitch in my life on the same team, undoubtedly, was Matt Letizia. By some stretch, I'll be honest with you. Um, he had, an, he had an, an, uh, an innate ability to put the ball for himself 
where it needed to be for him to do the next thing before before whoever was receiving it knew that that was going to happen. Yeah. And he's he's finishing for a for a guy who wasn't an out and out forward was absolutely scary. So like I said, I said in the story about the the best player on the team that I played was definitely Matt Letizia. I was lucky enough one time to play in a game um, on a pre-season trip for Southampton um, against Juventus, would you believe? <laughs> and, we, and we played, and that team, when I, when I look back, was absolutely ridiculous. It was like Jurgen Kohler, Andreas Muller, um, Paolo De Canio was the left back. <laughs> Baggio was up front with the Ali. It was, t- oh, it was unbelievable. And then Neil Madison went and scored to go 1-0 up. And then Tommy, the, I've actually the, I've actually seen this picture recently because Maddo put on our coaches group, you, and it, it's all, honestly the, the faces on it are incredible. <laughs> if if you pick like a, a sort of Italian sort of top twenty, probably <laughs> yeah. eight or ten of these people would be in it. it yeah. is, honestly, it's incredible. But I've never seen I've never seen a player command an arena like Roberto Baggio. I never saw anything. It was unreal. There was just an aura about the fella. And you thought, he was a good-looking sod, for one. He was fit as a feel. <laughs> he was excellent on the ball. He was like, oh, my God. I mean, he was, ad- the adulation was unreal. But after that game, we got to change shirts and bits and bobs. But by the time we got in the dressing room, I think it beat us 3-1 or 4-1 in the end. But um, there was a knock on our door. And Juan Luca Viali was stood there completely naked, everything in his hand. And he was like, I want his. He wanted Letizia's gear. That's a true wow. story. That it is a true <laughs> story. <Yeah. laughs> so I ended up getting a guy called um, Marocchi. I'm sure he's not sitting on the Zoom now saying I got Widrick and shit. <laughs> <laughs> he was an Italian international when I've gone upstairs. I know that. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah. talking about Shearer as well, Tommy. When when he was young player, could you see that he had that? I know. Obviously, he's not as good a goal scorer as yourself. But, <laughs> but was he scoring regular for the youth team and was it only a matter of time before he stepped up? Yeah, I mean, when I, when I first went down there, Alan was actually, Alan's got an August birthday, so he was still eligible to play for the youth team in the FA Youth Cup and the Southern right. Junior Football Cup. So he used to still play with us in the youth team. Um, he was a bloke. He was a man, strong, wrists like you know, massive. He was, that was his biggest strength for me. But you mentioned something earlier, I think he, his will to win and his, and his focus about where he was going was massive. And then, of course, he got the opportunity at 17, whatever it was, you know, against England's bloody future captain, Tony Adams, scores that trick. So that's just going to elevate your, your confidence, your standing at the football club. So he missed reserve football in, basically. He, you know, a bit like Rodney Wallace at the time. He did the same. Yeah. He went from youth team Maybe he's played a game or two in the reserves, but then bang, straight to the first team where most of the rest of us spent a period in the reserves. I went out on loan for, for I got 10 games when I was 18, 19 at Wigan. And then that, later that season, when, I, when I'd come back, I, went, I got my breakthrough then. So I was, I was only like sort of 21, 20. I think if you didn't get a game by the time you were 21 back then, you, you got moved on. Yeah. So I was, I was probably, the change of manager, the change of manager, um, Probably helped me a little bit, um, and I, and I got I got an opportunity. And um, all in all, I played I made about hundred appearances. I think I started about seventy five games. It might have been League One and then Premier League, but it was you know in the at the top flight. And I actually managed to do that at all the levels. So I played in excess of five hundred games all in, but a hundred of them at each level of the the divisions. And I did actually play on all all of the the, the pitches. The my last, would you believe this? Would you believe this? The last one I got to play on was one of the closest ones to where my dad lives. One of the closest. So it wasn't Hartlepool, obviously. It wasn't Sunderland, it wasn't Newcastle. It was Carlisle. I never played oh, a Carlisle man. all the way through my career for some reason. I don't know why. But then, then I did. And the, and the second to last one was Stockport County. And what... Would you believe Chris went to Stockport, didn't he, for a while? Chris Turner. Yeah, and he yeah, yeah. Me, and I nearly and I was going to sign. I was going to sign for Stockport. I still hadn't played, but I, I did. I played in the last eight games for Port Vale. I went back for a little spell there, and I managed to play at Stockport. So I managed to take them all off in the end, which was good. Talking about pitches, Tommy, and I was going to ask you about this. I was I never got the chance to go to the Dell and watch a game at the Dell or be involved in a game at the Dell, but. 
everyone speaks about it. And so what were your experiences of playing then? And, and did it help? Obviously, the Southampton team having that sort of environment. I remember going to QPR and playing at QPR and, and I felt like the fans were just right on top of you all yeah. the time. And, yeah. and you take the throw in and you felt like everyone was just on top yeah. of you and it was intimidating. And was it the same as, as Southampton? Very similar, very similar. It's a it's a myth that it's a small, it's a, it's a, it's a very compact ground, or was a very compact ground, but it was a myth that it was a small pitch. It was actually bigger than Highbury at the time, so I, I know that for a fact because I remember having a conversation with with people at the club, and they said, "No, the pitch isn't small. It's just as you said, the stands almost went up and over the pitch, so it, it did give you that feeling that the fans were." One thing I will say is, I mean, I, I look at uh, Premier League football now and. And people win home away. Probably might even be easier to win away these days. I don't know. But yeah. back when I played, if we won two or three games a season away from home, we did well. And we were we were in that division because of how we played at home, without a doubt. We I can remember, you know, we beat all the big sides. Even when I was in the team, we were beating the, the bigger sides. Not many came there and, and put us to the sword, to be honest. It was different when we went to their places, but it was a huge advantage for us, I think. Plus, you didn't get many away fans in, which, yeah. you know, corner where they put the away fans, everything else is three and a half sides of, um, of your own fans is a massive help. Uh, and I think if you've got a great record at home, it's usually stands in good stead. And the two seasons I played my most football, one of them we finished in the top 10. And I think if you look at the team that was playing at that time, the only player they brought in for money was Neil Shipley for, I think, a million quid. Um, which was a lot of money, but it was it's nothing when I look back. It's, I mean, it's, yeah. it, the game has changed so much. It's it is it is a different world now, isn't it? But um, yeah, the Dell the Dell holds really good memories. I, I only managed I only scored three goals for Southampton in my time, and they all came at the Dell, which was really nice for me. Um, against so, yeah. big teams as well, wasn't it? Against Chelsea and Leeds. And- yeah, I got I got two against Chelsea, funnily enough, and then uh, I got one against Leeds. Which actually put Newcastle top of the league. <laughs> was Leeds were top of the league. We drew. We drew. <laughs> it was the season Newcastle started like a house on fire, and we we drew on the Tuesday night at home. One one. I'm saying I scored. I think Carlton Palmer kicked it against me face and it flew in. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it was they were they were actually scored in relevant times. I had family visit. And it was a weird situation, and you could bet yourself then. I was 33 to one to score, and I was, was on. Deep. Decent oh, odds, then. Oh, that was on as well, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like Tommy, Carl Palmer might have had a few quid on you that night. So. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. So you said you missed out on playing in Newcastle. Did you ever get a chance to play at St James's? Yeah, yeah, I did. I, I was... I, yeah, I, I, it was funny. One time, the time I was telling you about, I got sent off the midweek before we came to St James's Park one season. I'm going to have to Google yeah. that tackle as well, by the way, because I've oh. seen you do some bad tackles. No, you haven't seen this one, mate. Oh, no, I, missed, I missed everything. It was just, I don't know what I was thinking. And the, the game was done. We got beat one nil at Paulfield. Anyway, we, that Saturday after the, after the Tuesday, we came up and we won. But I got binned. I got put on the bench and I was devastated. I was, I was warming up in front of the then paddock where, they, you know, on yeah. that side of the pitch near the dugouts. And then I heard, Widrington, you, whatever. And it wasn't a nice one. And I'm like, and I've looked round, and it's my uncle. And I'm thinking, <laughs> it's more Harry. I can't fuck. He went, you got red and white on. I was like, oh, I never thought of that. I like, <laughs> <laughs> so I got dogs abuse. But I, I, did, I did play the next season, I think it was. It would have been the next season because Paulie was still in charge. Um, and we, we got done off them 4-1 or 4-2 at St James's. But I went out afterwards with all the lads who were in that team, Robbie Elliott, Lee Clark. Yeah, yeah. We all went out for a beer afterwards and um, I, uh, I stayed up for the weekend and had a good, a good, good couple of days. But Laurie had heard all about it by the time I got home, so I got uh, <laughs> a little bit of reprimand when I got back. <laughs> so... Just talking about when when you've then moved on from Southampton, and you, 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 I think Grimsby paid quite a lot of money for you, didn't you? Was that a big decision for you in your career? Could you have stayed at Southampton and, and fought for your place? Yeah, yeah. I think I think we just talked earlier about strength of mind and your willingness to want to. I wanted to play football, and I'd played 
something like 60 odd games in the two seasons for Bowley and Bowley was leaving and Bowley rang me and told us that he was leaving and why um, uh, and when he did I heard that Graham Souness was coming in and I thought lovely he's going to really like what I, do, what I do here but I got a letter through my door and I just moved house I'd moved to a lovely new house in Southampton I had had a child a wife had had a child we had a young baby Nice new house, and I had a new contract offer from the land on me, land on my front door, and I was, like, what's all I about? So I went in to see uh, the bloke who sent me the letter, mm-hmm. and I went, what's that? And he says, well, we'd like you to sign a new contract. I says, well, that doesn't reflect what I've just done. I said, well, you know, and I never had an agent. I looked after myself all through my career. I never used an agent. I said, um, well. I said, what does the manager think? He said, the manager isn't going to be here. I said, does the manager know? Because Dave Merrington was in charge by this guy. And I was like, I was a little bit confused as to what to do. So I just, I, I contemplated. They'd offered me a new two-year deal and it was, relatively speaking, a little bit of an upgrade on what I was on, but I didn't feel, you know, it was right. Anyway, cut long story short, I'm, Laurie, Laurie then pulled me in and said, okay, he said, look, I've had, I've had bids from Charlton, Swindon, and Wimsby. And he says, you can speak to all three. I went, okay, well, that, if that's how it is. So I went, I went and spoke to Steve McMahon. The first thing he said was, I want you to play Wayne on the right because I'm still playing. <laughs> I, went, I said, that not work. I said, my long, they're long gone, me being out there, mate. I said, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, I went to speak to Alan Kirby's you. Um, and he wanted, he saw me play in the Premier League at right back. I played 11 games at right back. And he wanted me to go to Charlton as a right back. And I went, well, that ain't happening either. <laughs> and the, mo- the money at both of them clubs, obviously the, the London club paid a little bit more, but it, it was relative to what I was earning in the Premier League. So I was going to, I knew I was going to drop a division and my money really wasn't going to change. In fact, it was actually going, I go up a little bit. And then Grimsby, I, sp- I met Brian Laws. Brian did the best thing ever to anybody who's never been to Grimsby, if you're going to sign. He, di- he didn't take me to Grimsby. He met me in Nottingham. <laughs> <laughs> very, very clever. Very clever. Because I met him in the, ne- the Nottingham Hilton Hotel just off the M1, and he said, it's only about 40 minutes over there. I said, it may be and me. I took him at his word and realised it was an hour and 40 minutes over there. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a hell of a slap from where I was living. But they were the best pairs, weirdly. They were championship, they'd had a half decent season. What Brian did tell me, part of the story was, if you remember, he had an incident with Ivano Benetti. Okay, yeah, I remember him. that, yeah yeah. 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 Well, he told me he punched him, and he told me why, and I quite, I was quite a fair play to you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but what, what he didn't seem to realise was, whereas he thought the dressing room was right behind him on that incident, when I got there and I'd already signed, I quickly realised a lot of the players weren't behind him on that incident. So I think Brian was a bit of a dead man walking, which is when I'd gone there, you say they paid, I think they paid 300 grand down and a few more bits and bobs after I'd played a few games. Um, I felt a little bit awkward because he'd signed me, you know, like you said, how did they do recruitment? He probably spoke to one or two people and blah, 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 blah that's how it would have been done. Um, and I committed to there for three years, and within three months, Brian had gone. So it was a bit. It was one of them. I never regret anything, honestly. I really don't don't regret anything in football because I think you, you may, I made my own choices. I was never forced to go anywhere. And if I wanted to move, like when I wanted to leave Grimsby, I wanted to leave Grimsby because it was my decision. Um, when Alan Buckley first came to Grimsby, he told me, "You can go. Don't want you. You're not my player." You can go. They just turned off. Uh, they just turned a million down from Hearts, and he didn't let me go there. And then now the word that he tried to sign me at Blackburn, he wouldn't let me go there. And I went, "You, you told me you didn't want me. You went, yeah, but I, I need you." <laughs> it was a very different world back then. Um, but all my Tommy, about moving were, were mine. I remember at the time. I think I was leaving Middlesbrough at the time, and I came on trial to Grimsby, and. Um, I can't remember the manager, but was Andy King there at some point? Was it Andy King? Yeah. You still keep you ups on the floor. And, and that was one of the things I remember. The two things I remember, I'd had a bit of a ding-dong with Jack Lester. Jack Lester 
was at Doncaster, I think on loan or right. from another club anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I was on loan at Hartlepool and we had a bit of a, a ding dong, a bit of a spat on the pitch and they'd probably got a bit of a hand. And I walked in the dressing room at Grimsby because I'd like to be early. So I was like, I'll get there early and I'll see if I know anyone. I walked in and Jack was the only person in the dressing room. <laughs> and I went, hey, you all right? And he just totally blanked us. Just totally <laughs> blanked us. And I was like, oh my God, this is really low. And I remember him coming in and coming over and going, are you kidding? You all right? And he sat there. But then I went out on the pitch and um, my the guy who was looking after it at the time was like, Mickey, they're after a, a, a sweep where they're going to play three at the back. I ended up playing right wing back which didn't suit me at all. And then at the end, the, the guy came up and went there. Uh, where do you normally play? I was like, I normally play a sweep. He said, well, I don't know why I'd come down here. I've got no intention of playing with a sweeper. And I was like, right, well, that's me. But I remember Andy King sitting going, see, he didn't do as many kicky ups as me, Mickey. And he was oh, just wow. sat on the floor keeping the ball up in the stand and no playing head tennis in the stand. But yeah, it's the most awkward dressing room moment. I think me and Jack have ever, well, for me anyway. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, yeah, we could have been teammates a little bit earlier. Yeah, it no, it's, it's strange because... I really enjoyed my time with Grimsby, though. You know, we were talking earlier about moving moving as a player, but then a wife, then she didn't want to move to Grimsby. And I, you know, yeah. once you get there, it's actually a big place. And getting there is very difficult. It is, it's, it's one of them, you can't avoid them roads to get there. It's just one way in and one way out, isn't it? So it's, yeah. you know, but I, I really took to, to the people at Grimsby. And in fact, only last January, I went up to I went up to Grimsby and stayed with friends that I met in the Caribbean on a bloody cruise, would you believe? And I'd never met them before. I never met them when I was in Grimsby. I was standing, unlike me, I was standing in a bar on a ship. And, and this guy tapped me on the shoulder and he says, Are you Tommy Woodrick? And I went, Yeah, who are you? He went, I'm a Grimsby town fan. I went, All right. <laughs> we, had a, we had a beer and we kept in touch. And it's just one of them where I've been back to see him and watched the game at Grimsby as a, as a fan. And uh, yeah, I, I still view it as a, it was a good time, a good part of my, my career. But my relationship with the manager became such that I started parking in his car park space because my car was nicer than his. And he didn't like that. Because <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he, he, he resented the fact that I had a better car than him. But then, you know. That was something, though, that you talk about, you know, the meeting with a the fan there. But it, it seems to me, anyway, looking from the outside, that every club you went to, you had that affinity with the fans because of, I guess, that combative way that you played it of endeared you to the supporters in a way as well. Yeah, I mean, that's funny that because I actually, I took umbrage to a fan running on the pitch at Grimsby uh, in a game and there was two lads come on with a banner, each holding the banner and they were, they were, they were actually saying uh, Carr out and Mr. Carr was the chairman and he was a lovely fella. He was a bloke who... As far as I was concerned, he'd give me a great contract and he was paying me every week. He was my boss as such. And I didn't take too well to the fact that these lads felt it was right to run on the pitch during the game. So, you know, and, and I, I actually met them afterwards, but I grabbed, I grabbed it and rolled it up and chucked it off. And I scored it the weekend. After that, we, I think we beat Huddersfield 2-0. And it, it was actually recently come up as a memory on, on Twitter or something. And, I, and you see me running quickly, funny enough, mate. <laughs> running quickly after I've scored to where these guys were in the stand and I'm looking for them and they both jump out and cuddle me it's weird <laughs> it's a weird thing and, and it, it was one of them things where you think I wonder if they're going to jump out and punch me but I just kept my hands like that and they, they actually cuddled me I went where are you guys but um, talking about interacting with fans I'll never, this is a corker I'll never forget when we, when we got promoted it's, when we beat we got beat at Scunthorpe if you remember 4-0 but we got promoted on the day, didn't we? Yeah, I remember it. Which was, I do, and all. <laughs> my ball still landing in Grimsby from the penalty, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember, I remember, I realised, because a punter had screamed from behind the goal, Tommy, we're up, we're up. And because we've gone in and newly has got a face like a smacked arse. And we're, we're like, I'm, I'm thinking, does he realise we've been promoted here? Not that I'll go on to my feelings about that in a minute, but anyway, we... I've gone back out. We've all gone back out to say, well, like, the fans are now. And, and one of them's had a right go at me for missing the penalty. I mean, a real go. And I went... That's him. I looked at my badge and I went, you see that on there? I says, it says Hartlepool, not Liverpool. We're not that good. 
<laughs> and it, to be fair to him, it's an another one. I seen him at a social event in Hartlepool at some stage later, and they loved it. They loved the fact that I would talk to them and say what I thought, you know. Give I one of them a left sock and eat. Yeah, yeah. I, I, listen, at the end of the day, I'm a fan of football myself. So, listen, if I can't speak to people who, who pay to come and watch you, I, I took that as a huge privilege and an honour to be on the stage, to be honest with you. Because if I wasn't, I'd be behind the goal with the lads. That's what I would have been. You know, and I've been lucky enough to be in the game as long as I have, touch wood. And, and I wouldn't know what to do if I wasn't. If I'm being honest with you, it would be a difficult time for me. Tommy, I think that's one of the things that I certainly admired, and I know other people in the team at the time admire that you would say it how it is, whether it upsets someone or not, you would tell them. And I think that's I think that's quite often something that's not done that people will say, oh, and then go away and talk behind you, behind your back, and you find out a couple of days later that oh well, that was the time to say it. And if we spoke about this and, and we'll go back to when you came. I remember being in the dressing room when you only when he had the nitty gritty and you were and he was going around and you were the one, one of the only ones that went, nah, not having that mic. Do you know what I mean? Stood up from him and said something. Because well, well, he told a lie. He told a lie in that meeting. He told a lie in that meeting. He told he said to the players that I had said something to him about another player. Oh, in, that's all right, my, yeah. in all of my career, right? And I've advised players as it. And when I was a manager, if a player came in to see me and started telling me why he should be playing because the other one, Billy Bloggs, wasn't good enough, I'd say, stand up, go out, and come back in again, start again. And I'd do that and do that. And, and if he kept mentioning somebody else, I'd say, what gives you the right to talk about another player in here? Listen, if you want to talk about you, that's fine. But don't talk, don't bring other people. Because you've got to remember, I pick him. That means I yeah. think he's better than you in the first place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he's, but you he said something along the lines of you been moaning about this, that, and the other. And I went, whoa, hold on a minute. I've moaned about you. That's what I've moaned about. <laughs> I've moaned about you pissing 16 points away. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you can edit that bit. 60, I was devastated we didn't win that league. Devastated, honestly, Mick. And I was absolutely livid in the week that I went in and saw him. It was, it was about a week before the end, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 and he, he had a, he's had his meeting. Well, listen, if it had a work, if we'd won, I couldn't have had an argument. But I think the argument was right, to be honest. Just just looking back at the Hartlepool, and you were obviously brought in by Chris Turner for a very specific reason. I think the previous couple of years they'd got into the playoffs, not quite got over the finish line. Chris had gone into the press after the season and said, "We need some extra experience. We need someone with that a little bit of extra know-how." And, and you were one of the people who ticked those boxes. And it was almost like a, an assignment for you, wasn't it, among the other yeah. lads, to get Hartley pulled into the next division? Yeah, I mean, listen, Chris was, Chris was very definitive in what he wanted me to do there. You had experience in Beaver, Paul Stevenson, great footballer. Technical ability was superb. But he was, he was what he was. He was a better footballer than me, but he was a different character to me. And I think, I think Chris probably saw Beaver starting to go out the way. But he stayed a bit longer and it was it was a strange one because I, I'll never forget, as, it, as I said to you, it didn't start fantastically well. If I remember, we, we were, at one stage, we actually got bottom of the league, I think, when we lost it there, uh, Russian and Diamonds. And we all yeah, went to right. England play and we went on hell of a run. It was, <laughs> it was, <laughs> the bond and thing certainly weren't there. But, but it was one of them where, at the, at the time, I remember Chris coming to me and he says, I'd had a, I think I'd had a little bit of a problem with me back or something, I can't remember. And we had Mansfield away. And it was going to be a tough game. And, it, and I remember him quoting to the press and literally what he, he talked to me about. He went, look, I'm going to leave you, leave you at home this weekend. Bear in mind, I lived in Stoke-on-Trent at the time. I stayed with my dad a couple of nights a week in Newcastle. So he said, I don't want you doing the travelling. We've got no chance in Mansfield. I went, what? He went, we're not going to win at Mansfield. I'm telling you now, he says, I want them to see what we haven't got when you're not in the team. And that's what he said. And, it, and, he, and it, they got beat 3-0. We got beat 3-0. And he went in the paper and said, now I'm going to show you why we need him in the team. And then and I hardly ever <laughs> out the team after that. And it was like, wow, that's clever, that, like, right? what he's done there. <laughs> take, take him off for the team. I tell you what, it's a good job I got beat. <laughs> <laughs> the, other, the other thing Chris did for me, which was a real favour, I was on, I, was, I think back then it was even still when you totted up your bookings, you know, when you got points. And you had, you had well, I remember we had, we had Talkie away next Saturday. 
and I wasn't going to Torquay from Hartlepool on a bus. <laughs> he, he said to me, "You don't want to be making that trip." I went. He says, "Tom, why don't you get why don't you get booked today, and you can miss that one, and you'll be fit for the Tuesday night back at home against Stu Darwin." Yeah, fair enough. I'm listening to the bus. <laughs> I tell you a story, Tommy, about Chris and, and getting booked. And um, his first season when he came in, I I was captain. I was probably. 22, 23, what? And I'd had so many bookings, I had to go down to the FA. And it was like a week after Chris had come in. So it was awkward enough, he drove us down to Manchester. And I was like, oh, he's he's putting like Chris Rear and that on. He's trying to have a chat. You know, he's a lovely guy, but you just say, I don't want to be in the car with the new manager. Yeah. So he's like, he's like, Mickey, don't worry, when we get there, I'll do all the talking. And you've got them three old FA guys, you know, in, in the on the panel. And he's going to say, I'm going to go down the line of a young captain. You've got all the responsibility. We're near the bottom of the this, that, and that. I was like, right, that sounds perfect. And he had his briefcase. He opened his briefcase up. And he had all my bookings on a bit of paper. So, you know, you used to get three points. This is yeah. what it's for. Referee, rather. And he went like that on the table. And they all just scattered all over the room. So he's going around picking them all up. I'm like, oh, I could get put in prison anyway. It's that <laughs> <laughs> so I got, I got a, a little fight in a bad anyway. But um, I, it was just one of those occasions, you know, where you just went like that with a thing and they just scattered everywhere. And I was saying, this isn't a good start. Uh, how, yeah. did, how did Chris persuade you that Hartlepool was the place for you then, Tommy? He, he told me what, what you what you think he told me, basically. He said, I think I've got the the, the nucleus of a very, very good sign here. He told me who he was going to sign as well, because he signed about four of us on the same day. It was me, Trigg, uh, Humps, Bassey. Yeah. There might have been one of the one. There was, there was definitely for, then Flash come in a little bit later, I suppose. But there was four on the one day, and we all got stuck in a... In a brilliant bed and breakfast in Seaton Carew. <laughs> and I tell you what, the, Nor the Norton. The Norton Hotel. That was it. The Norton. And I could tell you a couple of stories out there, but I would, you'd have to put this out after nine o'clock. So we, 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 better, we better not go there. But we, we honestly, he, he didn't dress it up, said what it was. He said, I think we did this, this, and this. This is my plan. Daddy, daddy, daddy. He's very, very sweet. And the one thing he did say to me, which I thought, again, he didn't. He, he wasn't being detrimental to the group that he had, but he was. He said things like, "Tom, where you've played and the people you've played with, or the people you've played for, you might find our training a little bit repetitive." He says because, and I, he did. He did mention the centre off, and I'm not going to say who it is. Great lad, great lad, great player as well. By the way, he says because if I don't tell Dilly Blogs to do this on Thursday and then again Friday, he won't do it on Saturday. So we'll be doing Sorry. the same thing. <laughs> It's got to be Spike. Exactly. Are you kidding? <laughs> 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 tell us who it was. It's Spike. Okay, right, oh, right. But, but you know what? I, I actually thought I thought Chris was ahead of the game in the training techniques for having Nick and a university facility and all of that. I mean, yeah, I've played for teams in the championship, but never had that. Never had it. So from that point of view, uh, you know, Chris was Chris was up there with. The, the, he was a really good man manager. I thought his way he wanted to play the game was good. His his training methods were all were all very good. So he, yeah, I really enjoyed my time at Hartlepool. I got to say, you know, and I did get to spend a little bit more time in the northeast, which I haven't done for for a long time. So it was uh, it was it, really good memories for me. And ultimately, I, I helped do what I went there to do. And it wasn't, you know, that, was, that must give you a lot of satisfaction. Yeah, yeah massively. Yeah, I mean, I think any player who plays the game plays to win, don't you? And you can, only one can win leagues, but two or three can get promoted. And I've, I've done all right with that, you know, as a player and as a, as a coach as well. So it's 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 something it's uh, it's something to, to tell your kids about. They don't believe me, like, but you know, there's no videos left, is there? <laughs> the memory of the thing, uh, when, when, it, when it was announced that you were going to be our guest tonight, a couple of Hartlepool fans were and some of the memories there came. Obviously. Um, the, the first one that I would, would came up was when you scored and you put your sh I think you, you put on a flag and you, you, what was that all about? I don't know. I think, I think I'd think i seen it on the telly. I think I saw some <laughs> Italian or something do it and I thought, ah, what can I do? I, I haven't scored for young, so I don't know what to do. So I had to shave off, put him on there, we'll give him one of them. <laughs> <laughs> and there, was no, there, was no, like, there was no reason for it. It was just one of those things. It's still burning in my mind. I can still see you doing it. I, was I remember it. I remember it, but it was, it, I don't know. There was no, there was no real reason for it. You, you know. Well, Tommy, 
I said this last week to Richie because I was setting them up. I, I have actually just got a question come up on our WhatsApp group of one of the lads. And Westy wants to know, why did he get so angry when we're playing hearts if he played the wrong card? Because <laughs> <laughs> I make the win. I make the win. <laughs> I used to love that. I used to love hearts. I used to love it. Oh, God. He wouldn't, I don't know. I think he just used to do it to wake me up, to be honest with you. Yeah, he probably did. Uh, <laughs> but he's literally just, just come up there, so I thought it was a good time to ask him. Oh, <laughs> so good, and then this is, I've got to say, the, the guys the guys that Chris had together there, what he got it so right. He got it so right. Even Flash, as mental as Flash is and was, and I still speak to Flash now, I see him, because I'm part of the Exchange Foundation and stuff like that. And yeah, he... Even he fitted in, you know. <laughs> even, even he, he knew well to fit in anyway. At Flash, but he, but he was, he was just the right person at the right time, at the right place. And you know, I think Chris, Chris and Cole deserve a lot of uh, credit for that. A lot of credit. And I, I was, it was unfortunate for me that I, I got let go by uh, by Newley on, let's say Monday, and he got sacked on a Tuesday. So yeah, was, I was, you know, was going to I was going to ask you about that, Tom. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know whether I remember this right, but did you you came back for a little bit pre-season, didn't you, with Cooks? I was hoping you were going to ask Ken Hodcroft about that because Ken rang me as soon as he sat Mike and asked me to come back. Right. And I, said, I said I haven't gone anywhere. I said, as far as I'm concerned, you just need to offer me a contract. And he went. He says, well, obviously that's not my job. But he was right. You know, at the end of the day, the manager. And I said, he said, well, newly said that your legs have gone. And I went, oh, okay. All right. I says, well, I don't know what you want me to do. He says, well, would you come back for the first couple of weeks of pre-season? He says, Neil Cooper's... Neil rang me, to be fair. Neil rang me. He said, look, Tom, it'll be difficult. That's what he said. He says, it'll be difficult, but obviously you're more than welcome to come up and do the do a training. I'll, I'll let you know. I think he's going to Holland at the time. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And he said, I'll tell you before we go to Holland. So I'm not dragging you to Holland if it's not going to be happening. Anyway... The running side of it, I, I never had a problem with. I was always, you know, okay. I was in, I think I was in the 320 group for the thousands, and I was well in, well in saying me 320. So it, I did all the running, I did all the bits and bobs. And he come to me and said, Look, it's going to be really difficult um, having you publicly been let go. I said, Look, I've got no right with you at all, Neil. I understand. Um, so, yeah, I was, I, was, I was gutted that they didn't offer me a contract. And, now, and I look back and think you know, it was because of what happened with my my yeah yeah. Uh, yeah without a doubt because I mean I, I, I don't know it is what it is and I, look I, I was old enough and wise enough at that t- stage to bite my tongue and I've not spoken about it much since um, but it is what it is I, I thought I, I thought I'd earned a new contract that's what I thought you know I'd gone there done the business played the 30 odd games that season his decision to leave me out the last couple and we didn't get it done. And I was devastated. Honestly, yeah. I was absolutely gutted at Rushton Diamonds that last day. I, I didn't feel like I didn't feel like celebrating at all. Because I just I just felt I felt we threw the championship into their hands. That's what I felt we did. And I and I think we did it through lack of professionalism as a football club, not as players. And and that that that's important that people know that. It wasn't the players that did that, in my opinion. In my opinion. What was without wanting to put? Was there a clash between you and Mike then at the time? Was there a person? Yeah, um, not, not particularly. Not particularly. Just like Mike said, like Mickey says there, I was never frightened. If I didn't agree with something and I didn't care what it was, then I wouldn't. I wouldn't just sit there and take it. I think it's important if you do that, you've got to be prepared to have it. Someone's going to take a lend of you, you know. And so, and I wasn't prepared for that to happen. So I think I was probably just a strong will against a strong will fella, you know, and. and uh, there's only one person going to win when that happens, and that's the manager. And I accept that. I've got no problem with it. Um, I didn't ever do anything to, to you know, to, to make it an issue where oh, I can't have him in the dressing room. I can't do that. I would never have done that. So uh, it's just one of them things. Yeah, I remember walking out of the my last. I think it was Rochdale at home. I scored two goals. We drew two two, and I scored both bloody goals. And I remember going to the to me to my car, take my dad home. And a guy goes, no, he's staying. Are you sat as well? well? Hopefully, I haven't been up with a contract yet. <laughs> that was a punter asking me, are you staying next season? And then, then the next time, I, my dad came to the to the ground. My dad had a pint in the in the, near the station in the in the main drag in Hartlepool. And all the lads are in there saying, oh yeah. So Tom's staying. Then he went, no, he's not. 
He went, what do you mean? No, he's not. He went, no, he's not. He's, he's not staying because he's been off the new contract. <laughs> yeah, Punter's new before most, to be honest with you. <laughs> That, that, must, that doesn't sour what, what happened with Hartlepool at all for no, you. No, not my eye. Not with Hartlepool, no. No. Uh, it would have been, I would have found it difficult to work with Mike again, I suppose. But Mike wasn't there, was he? So, But, but it, wasn't, it wasn't that a big thing. It was just, I've got no problem with people disclosing if I say something. Because like it, Mike, Mickey's just said there, I'll stab you in the chest, I won't stab you in the back. Yeah, 100%. Not, you know, I think it's, it's what, yeah, it's important that people know that about me. In, in my job today, I have got to be so honest in, in, in transparent because if I start telling lies to people to try and bring them to a football club, I'll soon be found out. That's agents, players, managers, whatever it is, you know. So I think it's a, it's a big, it's a core value that I, I'll try to, to stick by in that you might like what I say, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> Definitely. And, I, and I, think, I think as a group, I mean, I certainly learned from that at the time where it's like, even though it might be a manager, if it's something that you disagree with, then from yourself personally, you've got to say, hold on, I, I'm not happy with that. Or And it, it, it's something that I learned from Tommy, especially that it's it's one of those things that you don't always have to accept what your boss says, really, if you disagree with it. And, and that person should be man enough to say, all right, well, we'll have this conversation, whether it's in an open forum or... In a, in a room and, and sort of take your side of it as well. So it, it's something that I've definitely learned and I'm, I'm not blowing smoke up the arse from me, but it's just like, there comes a point where you, you become a man. You have, to, yeah. you have to grow some balls and say, yeah, do you know what, yeah. even though you're my boss, I'm, I'm, I don't agree with that. And, and, and as I went through the... As as, Mark, as as Rob as Robinson used to call me granddad back then, and I was only twenty nine. I was probably one of the oldest in the group, if you remember. Yeah. So I yeah. used to take that. I used to take that on literally as well, because Chris had said to me when I went, "Look, okay, we need you as a leader." Listen, you were the captain, and I liked you as the captain and everything else. That wasn't an issue to me. I I was there to be the next voice, the next voice, the next voice. I would stand up for the players, but I would also do that if it wasn't right. But again, going back. It's, it probably sounds a bigger thing than it actually was. Yeah, yeah. I but can never it, remember. I can never, apart from that one incident, I, yeah. I would never have said to anyone that Tommy and Newley had had a fall and that would have been a, a bus stop or anything like that. It was no, it not at all. It, it was only because he said to the group that I'd said something to him about one of the players sitting in that room, and I didn't. And, that and was, you think, I think Newley was doing that to get a rise from someone else. Well, he was using he was using you. As ammunition, wasn't he? I wouldn't have minded that if he'd have told me that. I wouldn't have yeah. minded that. I did that. I did that to Darren Clock. I did that to Daz when, when Daz was playing for me in Salisbury, and we were getting beat one nil as we come in and off time. So I told him, "Oh yeah, Daz, come here." He said, "What?" I said, "Listen, I'm going to absolutely unload on you in the dressing room." Yeah. He says, "You've done that wrong, but I want a reaction out of them." Okay. Yeah. Anyway, not a problem. <laughs> So he's gone in there and I have, I've got him chucked something on the floor, stuck my finger in his chest and I said, you knew you were a disgrace. Da, 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 da. You're supposed to be leading these lot and whatever. And I was just sitting there going, afterwards, we've got, after the game, we won the game, I think. He's coming, man. That was a bit harsh, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. But, yeah. That must have, must have been the only game where he hadn't done anything wrong. <laughs> well, I always said to him, he was, listen, he was, he was unbelievable engine of the fella. He had the weirdest running action in the world. He was unbelievable energy, as you, you know better than anybody. And he was a great bloke for me to play with because I knew exactly that he wouldn't be coming back to do his defensive job. So I knew where I had yeah. to stand. So yeah. he made my job very easy. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't make my job very easy. I know that. <laughs> great bloke, though. He had done brilliantly. Uh, by the way. Yeah. Done brilliantly. Well, we had him on here and I mean, the, re the reception that he got from the Hartlepool fan. But to be fair, we had... We had Bristol Rovers fans yeah. messaging us and, and Walsall fans messaging us and, uh, and saying just that he's a genuine, honest person. And, and that's what he is. He always has been. And I think, he's like, he's a like top you player. said, if you're honest with people, you more times than not will get the best out of them. And I think yeah. Daryl's a, a perfect example of that. Even, yeah. though I've got, even though I've got to call him Daryl now. <laughs> oh, he doesn't like his nickname, does he not? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, you know, and I say this with with the utmost respect for him because I do, I, I really, really respect Daz massively. And 
we are, we are good friends, still good friends, even though I don't work with him anymore. I speak to him quite regularly. My missus and his missus speak. You know, our class him as a really, really good mate of mine. If you'd have asked me, who of that group that you played with at Hartlepool is going to be a manager, I'm telling you now, he would have been well down the list. <laughs> not, 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 not that I didn't think he was football savvy. He was very football savvy. Yeah, he was. Very, he very was. football savvy. But he just didn't come across to me like he could be disciplined enough. But he is. And I've worked for him as well as with him. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, Tommy, I'll, I'll tell you a thing. We, we, we met up in Sheffield. And you know what Trigg's like for his gear. He never owned a pair of jeans and this that. And... and and we met up in Sheffield and he turned up and he had like a pair of trousers on, a shirt and a blazer, but it wasn't like a trendy blazer, it was like, you know, a suit blazer. And then um, we're like, Trig, what are you, Daryl, sorry, what are you wearing? <laughs> and he's going, well, I'm a manager now, mate. I've got no professional at all times. And we were like, yes, yeah, sure, so. He was like, no, what happens if one of my fans is out tonight and I'm not looking smart? And, and in a way, I thought he was joking, but then... Another way, he, he wasn't, he was being serious. He thought he had this sort of perception that now he had to grow up and he had to be. But another thing that I love about Daz Mornay, so I remember going to Portsmouth when John Hughes was our manager and he came to the hotel the night before and we had a, we had a couple of beers and, and he didn't know John and we had a bit of a chat and he left. I think he was working at Portsmouth in the academy or doing yeah. something at the time. He texted me the next day, he went, you need to leave football. And I went, what do you mean? He went, you're not the same person anymore. You look terrible and you don't have that enthusiasm in your voice. And at the time I thought, gee, you passed it. <laughs> I did, honestly, I did. And then he was right. He was 100% right. And then when I saw him at Bristol Rovers, I saw him do an interview and I texted him exactly the same. I texted him exactly the same, saying, you need to leave. Just not football. You need a break. You look like you're worn out. Mm. And I don't speak to Daryl a lot, but he texts us back. Couple of couple of weeks later, when everything had died down, he was like, "You're right, Mickey, and I trust you being a friend that you were looking after us." And like I say, I don't speak to Daryl all the time, but he's invited us down to Walsall a couple of times to watch training, and and he, I just know he's he's got my best interests at heart. Yeah. And that day, I didn't want to hear what he had to say to us, but he, again, he was honest and yeah. he was looking after me as a friend, and that's the type of person he is. He was for all his for all his. Um... Com comedic value. I mean, he used to come in first game of pre uh, first day of pre season and say, "265 days to go." We've got 265. <laughs> He's not singing that song about going to Magaluf or something stupid. <laughs> and you think we haven't even started yet, man? <laughs> he, he was just he was off the wall, energetic, but he was he was a, what was the word? He was a charismatic lad. You know, he was he was just he was confident as well. He was self confident, which I think you need. But um. You know, you, when I was working with him for, for Bristol Rovers, I went there in the April. I think Daryl left in November, stroke December, and it was a tough thing for him to do. He, he decided, he'd, he'd have told you, it, you know, me and my missus went out with him and his missus about three weeks beforehand. And in my job, I said, Daryl, we need to change something. And he's like, oh, no, it's all right, it's all right, these lads are these. He's so loyal. He is so loyal yeah. to his players, which is a massive strength on one hand. But you've got to be very careful that he doesn't take you down the road that you can't see the fact that they ain't going to do anymore. They've done what they can do. Sometimes a group gets to the end because the group is better than the individuals. But if the individuals are start not to be good enough, then the group doesn't become good enough. Anyway, because I was fresh in the building and I had, I had actually watched Bristol Rovers as a, as a, as a scout for Coventry and, and watched with a view to possibly sign in a few players, none of which I recommended to go to Coventry. So I had a vision in my head that there were going to be one or two players that would probably move on. But Daryl had relationships with them lads. So yeah. it was a very difficult conversation me and him had, but I think I think I tipped it and so he knew what his right was. Me and me and Daryl stood in a bar when the two girls went and sat down in the restaurant. Me and him had a quick drink at the bar. And then we ordered another one as if it looked like we had like one other one and said to the waiter, I'll take it over to the table, we'll be over in a second. And as we sat down, <laughs> the waiter turned round and spilled all the drinks over Clarky's lap. I, <laughs> I says, This isn't meant to be this, it's not happening. 
<laughs> well, when he, when he was at Hartlepool, he used to get so much stick for his gear. Honestly, he had some of the worst club you've ever seen. And we turned up once on a night out, and he used to wear like cargo pants, and I think they're, they're probably trendy now. They're probably back in fashion. And he turned up one day with his black cargo pants on, the white shirt, and one of the lads went, do you know what, Daz? You actually look half decent, mate. You've, you've nailed it there. Turned round, he had a snake on the back of his shirt, or like <laughs> two snakes on the back, and honestly, he's been ripped apart for it ever since. Oh, God. Pump set was a thing the other day, and there was like a top footballer with a snake on his back, on his shirt, <laughs> and there was like, Trig's like 15 <laughs> years ahead of his time. <laughs> 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 That's brilliant. Well, we actually one of our one of our Christmas do's, if you remember, we went as fancy dress as each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, actually, I actually got my hair tinted and I got funny teeth to be Daz. I was wearing <laughs> I was wearing pedal pushers and white socks. I remember that because Tinks Tinks went as Effie and he wore you know one of those full white suits that you see the forensic <laughs> people wearing. He wore one of them, and, but then halfway through the night, he was like, I'm sick of this, I don't want to wear this anymore. And he just took it off, he had all his normal gear on underneath, so he just looked like he was on a normal night out. Yeah. That was uh, awesome. I, I can't remember. Uh, I know GM Sharp went as me, because he went as like a captain of the ship, you know, like he had a full officers. Who did that go as? And Ad Adam Boyd went as me, Adam Boyd went as me, because he went with a walking stick and a flat cap as no... <laughs> Oh, cool. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll have to. One of the lads will text us after. Oh, I can't remember our winners. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was a good do that. It was good when we went as each other. Yeah, right. that was over Newcastle, wasn't it? Just opposite the ground. We, that, yeah, right. I remember. Oh, funny old times. Good times. Good times. <laughs> Mick thoroughly loved that. You know, it took us down a few avenues that I wasn't fully expecting, but that, that's what's good, been good about these podcasts, that we have sort of just been able to see where the conversation took us. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, again, it's a brilliant insight into his role at a football club and how important recruitment is these days. And, and basically, he's saying that it's up to him which players come into the football club and the manager works with them. And, and it's quite a progressive style that it's, I know a lot of the, the teams higher up do that so it's a great insight I love Tommy to bits I loved his honesty I loved he, he, he was up for a scrap if he wanted a scrap and but he would put your arm around you as well if you wanted to cuddle you know he's that type of guy um, but what you see with Tommy is what you get and like I said he would, he would have an argument with a fan if he had to and if he thought something was unjust he would stand up for it but then if he was the other way and he thought he was in the wrong he'd hold his hands up and say yeah I was wrong and I think that sort of honesty is it's paramount in a football team. And, and he give us that, he give us that real experience, but that honesty as well. And as I say, there was a few scrapes in training, a few tattles, a few arguments with most people. But I think if he knew you were honest, he was, he was all right with you. And I think that came through tonight. And that's a type of man he is and, and still to this day in his job. Now, episode 12 next week is going to be a little bit different, isn't it? Yeah, I'm um, actually we on holiday, so there's going to be a guest presenter. Have you made that much money already? You're, you're, you're buggering off on holiday, is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Uh, uh, Seaton, that's how much money we've made. Blowing <laughs> the profits. <laughs> no, it was, um, it was planned before um, this all started. So um, I, I believe the guest presenter is going to be Mark Tinkler for next week, yes, which hopefully. Yes. Um, Will be good fun and and uh, he'll he'll do a good job standing in for himself. <laughs> well, have a brilliant holiday, Mickey, and uh, we'll see you in a, in a few weeks' time. Cheers, Mark. Take care. <laughs>